Hello and welcome back to Guillotine 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we are going to talk about one of the most important documents in civilization, the periodic table. And, and I'm not being facetious, I, I really do think it would make it in the top 10 documents ever created. And hopefully we'll be able to justify that statement throughout these next couple presentations. We're going to differentiate the four regions of the periodic table today. We're going to differentiate the terms group and period and we're going to talk about valence electrons. Uh, the, the terminology group and period are definitely important terms, and then the idea of valence electrons is really critical to understanding chemistry, so you're going to want to pay attention to that one. Now, what you know as the modern periodic table didn't always look that way. Uh, it, was, uh, it was based on the work of a guy named Dmitry Mendeleev back from the mid-19th century. He was a Russian uh, school teacher who wanted to organize the elements for his students, and he came up with a pattern that eventually led to the periodic table uh, that we know today. Now, other people were trying to do this too, but the reason Dmitri is given modern credit and is in the, it's been canonized as, as a scientific royalty is that um, he was able, through his periodic table, to predict the properties of elements not yet discovered. Uh, so he actually, his, his periodic table is so nice that he had gaps in his periodic table. Uh, because again, back in, in the, in the mid-19th century, they hadn't discovered all the elements yet. And so by knowing where the holes were, he was able to say, well, based on everything I know around it, uh, based on these properties, I can guess what these properties were. And so uh, Dmitry Mendeleev did some great predictive science. And that's why he's given the credit as opposed to the other people. And as Rao Hoffman, Nobel laureate, points out uh, in that little letter to the right-hand side, you know, Dimitri took the information he has, he organized them by the atomic masses as they were known, and then tried to fit them in on patterns. And that's, that's something we can all do, is, you know, have a list and cross things out and try to figure out where they go. There are four main regions of the periodic table. Metals, non-metals, metalloids, and noble gases. Metals are by far the largest region. That doesn't necessarily mean there's more metals than anything else out there. It's just based on the atomic structure. Uh, and the electron configuration may end up being metals, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, they tend, of course, to be malleable and ductile and good conductors of heat and electricity. Nonmetals, a lot of variety in the properties, even though they're a small chunk of the periodic table. Uh, so you're going to see gases and brittle solids in there. Metalloids are going to have intermediate properties. They're not great conductors, but they're not bad conductors. You might even call them semiconductors, and that's where you're going to find things like silicon. And then the noble gases, not to be confused with Alfred Nobel, he won the Nobel Prize. Uh, these are not named after him, these are named after the term noble, like a noble king, someone who doesn't want to mess with other people. Um, they are inert and unreactive. And even though they're chemically unreactive, they still have a lot of uses that we will uh, uh, explore. Hydrogen is put above group one. There are 18 rows of the periodic table, and I mean 18 columns of the periodic table. And so that's called group one right there, where hydrogen is above right now, um, because it shares structural similarities. It's got one valence electron, not to spoil what I'm going to talk about later. Um, some periodic tables actually put hydrogen above group 17, too, because of, of the way that it behaves. So that's why hydrogen's there, though. It's, it's more of a structural thing. Hydrogen is certainly not a metal. Now, the periodic table, again, I, I'm a little embarrassed that I, I never really thought about the name periodic table till well after high school, uh, but it's called the periodic table because it, there's, there's a sense of periodicity, repetition. Think about, about it by periodical that comes back uh, every, every month in your mailbox or periods of the school day. And that's the idea is you're going to see these like periods of history. Uh, there's these uh, beginnings and ends. And uh, periodicity is the idea that as you continue on, you're going to start seeing a repetition of things like days of the week. Uh, you, you know, your, your Fridays are going to all have kind of a similar format. And your Saturdays are all going to have a similar format, too. So if you wait long enough, another Friday is going to come around. And that's what we call the horizontal rows of the periodic table periods, also known as series, although periods, I think, is a better uh, uh, term. Uh, just like a lineup in elementary school, things closer to each other in a period are more likely to have similar properties, just like you're most more likely to be the same height as someone who is standing next to you uh, for school pictures. Uh, the... Vertical columns of the periodic table are known as groups or families. And families is a great name because like families, they share not only structural properties, uh, but behavioral properties. And that comes from valence electrons, which we'll discuss. Uh, 
I know I'm painting in broad strokes, but you probably have similar physical features to your family, and you probably have some similar behaviorisms, um, although you, you hate to admit that. <laughs> There's Boron, he's always getting trouble from his, from his parents. And so these little guys, uh, question, bear, and answer dog, are here to help guide us through the idea of balanced electrons. Now, the most important electrons in an atom are the outermost electrons. Uh, those are called valence electrons. They're the ones that are involved mostly in chemical reactions. And so by looking at the valence electrons, you'll determine the reactivity. All atoms start between 1 and 8 valence electrons. Uh, there are 18 columns of the periodic table, but if we drop out the transition metals, that leaves 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. The transition metals are that group of the metals that are dropped down. And so uh, by looking at that, that'll give you a lot of information about their reactivity and properties because all atoms want to get to the magic eight, uh, with, with a few exceptions. They want to get eight valence electrons, and they will gain, lose, or share to get there. And so if, as, as AnswerDog points out, if you know the valence electrons, you really have a big leg up on the properties of that atom. And so let's look at the ramifications of this. If you have a full outer shell, meaning you have eight valence electrons, uh, then you are unreactive, you are inert. Atoms want full outer shells, that's all they want. Uh, remember, they don't want to stay electrically neutral. Every, all atoms start electrically neutral, but they'd much rather end up being positively or negatively charged if that gets them a full outer shell. Um, now the noble gases start that way, but other atoms are going to gain or lose electrons to get to the same place. If you're almost at a full outer shell, you'll want to gain electrons. And so this is what the non-metals like to do. They have six, seven valence electrons, and so they're going to want to gain that last couple to get there. And the closer they get, the more reactive they are. Think about if you're collecting Pokemon cards and they come out with a rare eight card edition. If you had seven of those eights, you would have a strong desire to get that eighth card no matter what. Um, but if you were farther away, you'd still want those cards, but you, you don't see it as a closer goal. And the same thing kind of goes on the other side, except they're trying to lose electrons. Remember that if you only have two cards in a set, getting six more cards sounds really tough. And so if all you care about is having full sets, you might want to actually just lose the two you have so that you have your remainder sets. I like to think of this like a box of chocolates, where there's a layer of chocolates where there's only one or two chocolates left. And so you eat those one or two chocolates, pull up the paper, and voila, there's that full shell underneath. And so this, this concept of gaining or losing electrons to get to a full outer shell is really uh, where ions come from. And it, it might be worth your time to go back to the last lesson where I talked about the most likely charge of different families in the periodic table. And see if you can uh, consolidate the information I gave you today about gaining and losing electrons with a family's uh, ionic charge uh, trends. You know, why is group one a plus one charge? Is it because they want to lose one balance electron? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll let you dig a little deeper. But we appreciate you watching and hope you learned something. Have a great day.